Jeff Froning joining us from TU, as I can say here. Uh, she issued her undergraduate and grad work at UT before moving to Space Telescope as a postdoc. At some point, you started building ultraviolet spectrographs, uh, moving to Colorado, where I think you've done a long time before coming back to UT. But they should be telling you about the great work the costs that you're doing uh, as a result of those events. Thank you everybody for having me here. It was a nice drive in this morning. Uh, good to be back. This is my second visit to a &M. My first time was last year for a GMT meeting, so uh, it's nice to see this part of the country. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about a project that's been occupying quite a bit of my time over the last uh, 12 years, I guess, and that was building uh, and deploying the Cosmic Origins spectrograph on the Hubble Space Telescope. This is a picture right here of the day they opened up, this was the extravehicular activity day three, where they opened up this bay and took out CoStar and put costs in, as well as doing um, the electronic repairs on ACS. This is a slightly less attractive picture. Cost was actually installed during orbital night, so we don't have the fancy picture on the previous page. But you can see uh, Drew Foistel on the arm here and John Grunsfeld helping as they're sliding costs into the uh, bay that they just pulled CoStar out of. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history of the development, how, do you, how does a project about building for space come together, and I'll then discuss the principal design features of the instrument and get a few of the science results that have happened since the instrument was installed. Uh, and then I'd like to briefly talk at the end about looking ahead to the future of UV science in the astronomical so Cosmic Origin Spectrograph, or COS, was the fourth generation instrument for the Hubble Space Telescope, and it was installed during servicing mission four in 2009. That was the Space Shuttle Atlantis uh, STS-125, Flight 125 of the shuttle, uh, went up to Hubble and did a number of repairs and, and instrument refurbs. Um, they installed two new instruments, COS and Wide Field Camera 3, as well as repairing STIS and ACS, um, both had electronics failures, and then did a whole host of uh, upgrades for the telescope as a whole, new gyros, new batteries, new solar panels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, COS in particular is a UV spectrograph, uh, covers from about the Lyman limit to 3200 angstroms, and the intent of the instrument is to maximize sensitivity to, to point or point-like sources at resolving powers of 2000 to 20,000. Um, the far UV sensitivities, which is the sort of the main part, that's the part of the um, wave band from, say, uh, around Lyman Alpha, 1200-ish, 12, out to 1800 angstroms is where most of the science return to the instrument is. And the sensitivities there exceed comparable modes in STIS by factors of 10 to 30. And then the NUV channel, which was added as a backup to STIS, it was sort of retrofitted into the design. It's about two times as sensitive, I and mean, it really is used it's used in a few cases, but in general it was designed as a backup to STIS. Um, the backgrounds are significantly lower than STIS. I'll show you some of the background numbers later, and as a result, you're not only improving the signal and the signal noise equation, you're decreasing the noise. And so for brighter targets, you can get observing efficiencies that are up to 100 times faster than with STIS. And so that really enables survey level science on large numbers of targets. Cost and STIS provide powerful complementary spectroscopy capability. When COS was designed and proposed, it was always known that STIS was going to go in ahead of it. So as COS was designed to be complementary, it does one thing better than any UV spectrograph has done before, that's sensitivity. Whereas STIS is really the workhorse instrument for HST. It does everything. It has about 250 different observing modes, although they only support about 125 of those. But you can do everything. You can do optical spectroscopy, you can do UV, you can do low res, you can do high res, you can do long slit, you can do polarimetry, you can do pornography. So STIS is the, the workhorse and COS is the specialty instrument. Uh, as I said, it was successfully installed in 2009 and it's been performing well. Uh, I checked the literature as of Friday. There are well over 200 referee publications in the literature using COS data. Um, we typically get about a quarter of the prime orbits, that's the general observer program on Hubble. Uh, and then every cycle, where there's also one or more large programs that are at, um, that take place on cost. Uh, we also, our team, as part of the instrument design and build, were given a 555 orbit guaranteed time program. The last target on that executed last year, so we just finished that out, and uh, that was quite successful. And I'll discuss briefly some of the science of that. 
Principal investigator for costs is Jim Green at the University of Colorado Boulder. I'm the project scientist. Steve Osterman is the instrument scientist. The instrument was constructed of Ball Aerospace, which is about a mile and a half down the road from uh, the uh, astronomy building that we were in, and so it was very close. We've done a lot of work with Ball over the years. Uh, and this is a picture of the assembled instrument in the Ball uh, clean room just before it's ready to be shipped off to Goddard Space Flight Center. And our additional partners were Goddard Space Telescope Science Institute, UC Berkeley, who built our far UV detectors, uh, and then we have science team members at Wisconsin and Southwest Research. So it took us a long time to get there. This was not a short process. Um, there were a couple of road bumps along the way. Um, sometimes when I talked, I started in ground-based uh, observing and instrumentation at UT as a grad student, and, and I've done a lot of work in that area as well. And whenever I talk to ground-based people, they say, I don't know how you can handle it working on space hardware. You know, you could spend 20 years of your life and then it explodes on the rocket on the way up. It can go up and stop working. And I guess you just kind of deal with it. Um, it, it <laughs> It doesn't hurt that you get a lot more money than you do on the ground-based side, which helps uh, pad out some of that. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about how that is uh, important as we go along. So COS was proposed and selected in 1997. That's before my time. I was still a grad student. Um, but that uh, Jim Green and his team at CU did that. And immediately within a week of being funded, their project budget expanded by 30% because Goddard called them up and said, we have this disparate detector, we really want you to build an NUV channel to go with it, so they had to retrofit in their design, and you'll see that later on the optical design, that the NUV channel looks somewhat odd because it was placed in later. The instrument was designed and constructed over a six-year period. Uh, I joined the team in 2002, as just as they were finishing up the design, I was involved in a lot of the work for the final tests on the ground, where we put the instrument in a vacuum chamber and run it at the temperature and vacuum conditions you expect on orbit to make sure you meet all the safety, technical, and science requirements for the instrument. So we actually delivered the instrument to Goddard in the fall of 2003, so 11 years ago. It was done and ready to go in time for a 2004 launch. But unfortunately, because of the Columbia shuttle disaster that occurred in the same year, the decision was made by the NASA administrator, Sean O'Keefe, to cancel the uh, servicing mission. Uh, but this is where the money part comes in. <laughs> they, I, I think there was always a realization that O'Keefe's decision was not very popular with just about anybody else involved. And so they actually kept the team together. They kept everybody on salary, uh, both at Goddard and at university level, people like us. Uh, and they used that time to examine alternate options like robotically servicing Hubble or using a different launch platform. But I think the understand was always that you know, they probably were going to be going back and reinstating the mission. We also modified our electronics boards in 2006. In the meantime, they had determined that both ACS and STIS failed for the same component on their electronics boards, a power converter that wasn't sufficiently rugged. So we, we uh, installed new boards and they also created repair boards for the two broken instruments. In October, the uh, servicing mission was reinstated, so we went through a second round of tests to verify the new hardware. Uh, and then we drove it for an October launch. Great, we're ready to go, right? Uh, put it in the shuttle, we're, you know, we're two, three weeks from launch, when the science instrument command and data handler failed on Hubble. This is the component that sends all Hubble data, science data, back to the ground. All electronics on Hubble are duly redundant, so one side of that instrument failed and the other side came up, so there wasn't actually any real interruption in science. But if the second side had failed, that would have been the end of the mission. So they decided, well, we're going up there anyway, let's put off this mission and pull out the spare board, uh, SIC and DH and get that thing installed as well. Um, there are jokes that, you know, this is 19 years after launch that they called up the engineer and said, at Goddard and said, could you pull out the spare SIC and DH board? And he's like, spare. <laughs> Where's the spare? You know, they have to figure it out, but they, they have pretty good, <laughs> pretty good um, documentation. So they did that. We go back into the launch bay. We launched in May. We spent the summer. Um, verifying instrument performance with Space Telescope Science Institute and started science operations in September of 2009. There was also a big press conference and I worked with people at STSCI on press materials. However, if you remember after the last servicing mission, you probably don't remember any spectroscopy press releases. We, we developed them, but they usually don't make the cover of the New York Times. Uh, so I'm going to show you a few pictures from the actual launch experience. This is me here, uh, Spatial Atlantis there, that's Jim Green, the PI, that's Frank Cepelino's head, uh, head of Hubble Operations 
at Goddard who's run all the Hubble servicing missions. We actually had a really good gig because our far UV detector had to stay under power. The far UV detector was uh, vacuum, under vacuum until we launched it. And in order to keep it under vacuum, we had to run ion pumps. And so they let us keep it on until launch minus nine days, but Kennedy had never done that before. They never had power on the launch pad that far in <coughs> the operation. They basically let us keep it on until they fueled the shuttle, and then we had to turn it off. Uh, but they did say that if you're going to have that type of power, we need to have 24-7 fire watch. And so this ended up being the best professional boondoggle I suspect I will ever have in my career because we got passes to go everywhere on base and we got to follow our instrument from the clean room all the way out to you know, putting it in the shuttle bay and so that was sort of a once in a lifetime experience. Well, I used to joke it was once in a lifetime but then we got to do it twice after they <laughs> pulled the instrument out. So I'll just run quickly here through a few pictures. I'm running a little slower on the introduction. This is uh, the clean room at Kennedy Space Center and they're lowering costs into the container. It'll ride in up to the telescope, and here's a picture of the same thing for a wide field camera three being loaded into its container. Everything that's going to go in the shuttle is then put in this large canister, which is basically the same as the shuttle except in reverse. And it's then driven on a truck from that clean room I showed you to another building called the Canister Rotation Facility. You get a lot of acronyms in NASA space. This is the CRF building. And basically, we spent the whole day and a very, very large crane turning that canister from horizontal to vertical, and there I am in the room. And uh, that's it now coming out of the room, having been turned up. And this is what we were doing. Uh, this is the uh, electronics readout for our ion pumps and our detector. So that's our job was to stare at that and make sure it didn't spontaneously combust. <laughs> so here we are driving out at a grand total of five miles an hour to the launch pad, which is about eight miles down base. Uh, you can see the VAB building in the back. Uh, this thing driving long. This is actually five miles an hour is pretty fast. When they take the shuttle from the VAB out to the launch pad, that crawler, the Apollo crawler, can only go about one mile an hour. So, once you get out to the launch pad, they've opened up this rotational support structure, the RSS, and you then raise the canister up, canister up, and there's a clean room here, five stories up into the RSS. And then, in theory, you lower the canister, close that back up, and then you open the shuttle bay doors and load everything. We got to do that twice because they got about this far off the ground and it got stuck. There's some shoes that were supposed to go up in a rail just to direct the uh, canister and they must have gone up too fast and they went like that and got stuck. So they hung there for a few hours and then lowered it and tried again the next night. And it's at that point you start to, you know, I, I'm hearing little little numbers in my head, cha ching, you know, this is how a, how a, a servicing mission can cost three quarters of a billion dollars. Right? It's not just the hardware, it's that at this point, although you can't see them, there are about 100 people on the ground and up in the superstructure, plus us, plus the safety officer, and we all got to come, and this is nighttime work, and everybody got to come back and do it again. Here we are now in the clean room, this is me and Jim on our shift, uh, and you can see this is the, this is the <coughs> hardware going in, and this is the shuttle bay, you can see the airlock right there. And so that's all the material being loaded in. Yep? Why, why weren't you able to do it during the day? The lift, temperature, I think it's temperature reasons they don't want the sunlight. You know, it's pretty hot in Florida, so they just don't want as much ambient sun shining on that reflective material. Uh, there's also somebody, I forgot about this, there's somebody whose job is to sit on that launch pad by the shuttle in a chair with an air horn, and every time a bird comes by to fire the air horn, because the birds like to peck on the thermal blanketing material in the fuel cells. Nice. Can you imagine? That's a boring job. <laughs> Do you have a question? No. Okay. It's, uh, I don't think I have a fancy title for that person. Probably. It's probably a three-letter acronym. <laughs> uh, one other good story. I wasn't on shift for this happening, but Jim was. Uh, you know, so this is three stories tall here, and so when people are working up high, everything has to be tethered, tied in place. And the guy was working with a wrench, and he tethered the wrench, but he neglected to tether the socket on the end of the wrench, and it fell off. Uh, and there were 100 people in the room, and Jim said it went dead silent as you hear this ping, ping crash. It hit the side of the shuttle bay. Oh. It just missed, this is about $800 million of flight hardware, and then hit the ground. So they had to take a day to figure out if the shuttle was damaged, and that is a way to lose even a union job <laughs> at uh, Cape Kennedy. This is a nice art shot. This wasn't taken by us as a NASA photographer. Uh, one other unique thing about this mission is the only mission that had two shuttles ready to go at the same time. Um, as you recall, after the Columbia disaster, they wanted to have, if there were any problems with 
future shuttle missions, they can go to the space station as an emergency break. Um, but based on the relative orbits of Hubble and the space station, that wasn't an option. So they actually prepped Endeavour and had it on the second pad just in case they needed to do a rescue mission. Okay, so we launched eventually in May. And uh, you can see the pictures here. We were at Banana Creek about two miles away. And that thing you, gets out like a bat out of hell if you never saw a shuttle launch. It's pretty amazing. And then that was when our work really started. We had a lot of parties down at Kennedy, but once it launched, we had to go up to Goddard because during the actual installation of the instrument, the, um, the uh, so this is costs on orbit being pulled out to be installed. And this is John Grunsfeld's hands. He's doing the ACS repair here. Once they do those installations and repair, they then do a power and aliveness check to make sure while they're still out there on the spacewalk that if they didn't set a cord properly, that the instrument's working. So we're all there waiting for the data to come down and to show that the instrument's alive. Uh, and then we waited a few months, uh, about three or four weeks for the instrument to outgas, and then we were able to start the uh, calibration observation. All right, so that's sort of, in a nutshell, how, how you get an, an instrument designed and installed on the Hubble Space Telescope. So let me tell you now a little bit about the instrument itself. Um, Oh, I have another picture of this on the next page. Just text. This is the design cost. Uh, <clears throat> keep in mind this is retrofitted into an existing telescope, HST. It's retrofitted into a bay that already exists. So you have to come up with some, you know, you're going to have some geometrical constraints on putting the instrument in. Uh, but this is what it looks like. The light comes in from the telescope optics here. We do not have a slit. This is a slitless spectrograph. All we have is a um, primary aperture. It's like a field stop. Uh, there, so it does go through an aperture, but that's mainly just to keep out background light. It then hits this first grating wheel here, and for the far UV modes, it hits a um, holographically ruled grating and goes straight to the detector. Um, the reason that you want to do that is in the ultraviolet, every bounce loses about 50% of your light. So if you're trying to maximize sensitivity, then the only way to do that is to minimize the number of optics. There have been improvements in coatings, there have been improvements in detector throughput, but you really need to get rid of your optics. So this is a holographically ruled grating. The grooves are designed specifically to, you know, disperse the light, re-image it on the detector, and correct for the holographic, I mean, for the spherical aberration of Hubble in a single optic. Uh, the NEV channel was retrofitted, as I said, so there's also a mode where you can put a mirror in and direct it to a secondary instrument here. Uh, Collimator mirror, camera uh, gratings, camera mirrors, and then onto the uh, NEV detector. The wavelength coverage is a little odd. We get three small non-contiguous stripes uh, on the detector, and that was again because we were retrofitting in the, the flight spare from STIS, so we had to just deal with what we could fit into the space. Um, as an aside, I noticed on your schedule next week you have Chris Clemens coming to talk to you about his work on curved gratings that he's building, BPH gratings. Chris likes to give that talk and ask if anybody in the room has heard of curved optics because most people in the ground-based world, most of our designs don't, curved, curved gratings and curved detectors. Uh, so next week I want you all to raise your hands when he said he's heard of one. <laughs> and you can say just last week you heard about the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph which uses, the, uh, uses curved gratings and curved focal planes, uh, it's called a roll and circle design. And so uh, you can tell Chris I pumped. This is a picture of the cost bench. This is actually a reuse of the Goddard um, GHRS, Goddard High Resolution Spectrograph. That was brought back to the, to the ground in one of the previous servicing missions, so we reused the bench. And you have the optics on top, and then separated from them, you have the electronics down there. This is a picture of the instrument being wired at ball, and another shot there uh, coming together. This is a picture of the cost detector. This probably doesn't look like most detectors you're used to. For one thing, you may notice the size of the hand. This is big. This is 18 inches across. As I said, it's a curved focal plane. There are two different segments here. It's a microchannel plate detector, and I'll talk a little bit more of that in future slides, but you basically end up with a very long spectrum. Each segment has 16,384 pixels in the dispersion direction times two, so you can get pretty broad spectral coverage with the detector. All right, principal design features I've mentioned, slitless spectrograph, 2.5 arc second aperture. You can observe extended sources You just as you're filling your aperture because it's slitless, you'll, you'll get lower resolution. So a source that completely fills the aperture, we've done supernova remnants, your maximum resolving power is about 2,500. 
Uh, we actually have the best spatial sampling on Hubble, 23.5 milli arc seconds per pixel. Here's a nice shot of Pluto and Charon that Alan Stern took as part of our guaranteed time. Uh, unfortunately, you have itty bitty field of view, so <laughs> best spatial sampling, really small field. Uh, the imaging mode is actually mainly used for target acquisition. Uh, as I said, the main channel in the far EV has one optic, uh, and that's done using a holographically ruled grating where you can actually dial in the shape of the groove pattern to higher, uh, higher order polynomial function to allow you to, to design out that, um, to design out, to design in the dispersion and, and correcting for aberration. And that, the design work was done by Jim Green as part of the optical design. The actual construction is done by Jovan Yvonne in France, and that, Part is proprietary, so Jim tells them what they, he wants, and they say we can do that, but they they, won't, they don't tell you how. Uh, and as I said, the, it's a curved focal plane. It's called a roll and circle design, which is basically if you can think of the grating and the detector being on a circle of the same diameter. And it, that's a nice design if you have if you have curved optics and curved detectors, because you can get rid of all the aberrations except for astigmatism using that design. And it's a little bit modified because we can actually dial in these these more specific patterns you can offset it from you don't have to be at this on the same axis you can offset a little and that allows you to decrease the packaging um, we always knew that the far UV detector it was sensitive to very blue light technically it goes down to the EUV the detector is sensitive to 200 angstroms or even less um, but the question was what would we get from Hubble Hubble had been up there for 18 years the coatings uh, use magnesium uh, mag fluoride which as some throughput, but we don't know, you know, as there been degradation of the performance. So the instrument was rated to a blue cutoff of 1150 angstroms. This had already been there, so they knew the instrument sensitive to that wavelength. But when we put it on, we actually found that we had appreciable sensitivity down to the alignment limit, and frankly, even below. This is a, the effective area curve, and you probably can't read the numbers. The main issue is that our peak sensitivity, 3,000 centimeters squared, which is where we're about 30 times more sensitive than STIS, is here around Lyman Alpha. And as you get down toward Lyman Beta, you have about a factor of 10 to the 3 decrease in throughput, but that's still actually higher throughput than, say, the FUSE mission, which was the previous uh, instrument to fly in this range. Um, so they developed some new modes where they turn over the far UV grading G130M and they can actually get you down to the Lyman limit and you have a little bit degraded resolution because you're so far off blaze but uh, some people have been using that to look for Lyman Alpha Escape and other projects like that. Uh, these microchannel plates are photon counting detectors so there's no read noise and you time tag every incoming photon event. Um, technically you can go down the, the Berkeley guys have been you know, playing with instruments down at SALT that have a <coughs> nanosecond time resolution. But the electronics for this instrument and on Hubble basically give us 32 millisecond time sampling. Uh, I think I've mostly discussed this part. Uh, another interesting point is that the, we can actually calibrate the um, wavelength solution of the instrument on orbit. So here's where the main science data fall. And then slightly above that is where the calibration for the lamp falls. And so we actually flash that on orbit. And we do that because when we first built the instrument on the ground, what we found was we would go to a setting on the grating and then it would drift, about two resolution elements. And they did quite a bit of work to try and figure out if they could just fix that mechanically. But it ended up that the amount of drift was basically equivalent to the thickness of the lubricant on the gears in the, uh, in the grating wheel. So there was just nothing that Done. And we always hoped that it wouldn't be an issue once we got to zero G, but we put in this tag flash mode. And in fact, actually, uh, as far as I'm aware, they haven't had any serious drifts on orbit, but we still observe that. Sensitivity performance is excellent. As I said, at its peak value, we're around Lyman Alpha, we're about 30 times STIS. The background is extremely low, um, 4 times 10 to the minus 6 counts per pixel per second, or as one colleague likes to say, one count per resolution element per fortnight mm -hmm. is basically the uh, background. And so that's why we can get really fast uh, observing speed. Just a few minor issues on orbit. There was one potentially scary one, which was that after we installed it, the sensitivity was dropping. And at times, the slope of the drop looked like it could be as bad as a loss of 30% per year at certain wavelengths. So that was a lot of panic. Um, we finally decided that this is probably due to residual atomic oxygen. Hubble is not in a full vacuum, it's in low Earth orbit. And we brought up, of course, some um, air in the instrument itself. 
And the detector, this is the first time that one of these micro channel plates was flown open face without a protective window. That's part of the reason our background is so low. Stis, Stis's entrance window, for example, is its, one of its dominant sources of background. Uh, and so the atomic oxygen was actually um, uh, attacking the cesium ion photocathode on those detectors. So there was a lot of panic about that, but then it just tailed off. And so now it's just a few percent a year basically lost. And so probably that, that uh, oxygen outgassed and we were okay after that. But that's the sort of stuff that keeps you up nights after you think you're, you're in good shape. So let me spend the rest of the talk, um, second half of the talk, discussing some of the science results with the instrument. It's just a partial tour. And in fact, I redesigned this talk because I used to try and stuff in a bunch of different topics and it, I think it was too fast. So I'm just gonna talk on a couple of points today. Uh, the first thing to emphasize is that when you propose an instrument for NASA, generally speaking, you, not, you, you don't just propose to build the instrument. It's not like the ground-based world where in the past there would be people who build instruments and people who use them, and there's been sometimes a bit of a divide. With COS, we not only presented an instrument design, we presented a full science case for why would you want this in Hubble? Why is this an instrument that should be part of Hubble's instrument suite? And we proposed a full science program as our own team. So it's not only that we're saying what a general observer could do, but we actually proposed and we got, as I said, 555 orbits of our own time. So it's much more integrated product. And so these are the science themes uh, basically that all fall under the heading of cosmic origins, that when you have spectroscopy, you can actually get true astrophysic, astrophysical detections of chemical properties and kinematics, and that drove a lot of the um, science drivers for the instrument, and in particular then a certain res resolving power as well as a certain sensitivity. Uh, and then our main science areas were looking at the intergalactic medium, the large scale structure of the universe, some work on stars, and work on them. At the time this was proposed, the planetary system was all solar system work. That was the Southwest Research Partner, but we actually did some work on exoplanets too, because events caught up with it. So I've listed here, I, I go through every year through all the accepted programs that uh, use costs on Hubble, because I like to get a feel for what the instrument's doing. And I just, this is just my sort of blurb on the things I've noticed that are particularly being the instruments being used for regularly. And a lot of them are things we expected, like the intergalactic medium. That's the bread and butter of this instrument. Um, but there are also a lot of things that I don't think, I, well, I know we didn't think about in advance. And one of the ones that's been getting funding every cycle is white dwarf debris disks. People are actually looking at spectra of white dwarfs and finding metal abundances, and they're able to tie those into showing that they couldn't be upswelling in the star, that they have to be rocky material left over from old solar systems that are being accreted onto the white dwarf. That was gotten funding every cycle and a large program, so that's pretty impressive. Uh, and then I've highlighted some of the areas I'll try to either talk about or skip. I'll briefly discuss the IGM just because that's what so much of the work's been done. But that's not my research. I'm not a cosmologist, so I won't talk in too much detail. Maybe you heard from Jess Work last week on, I don't know if she did any work, we discussed Costco. I'm also not going to talk about black hole accretion physics, although that was actually my portion of the Guaranteed Time Program. Uh, I, I have a few papers where I looked at um, accretion onto black holes uh, in X-ray binaries. So if you're interested in that topic, please talk to me. But uh, like I said, I, I was trying to stuff too many things in this talk. Uh, instead today, I'm going to focus on something we've just kicked off, which is a large program with a uh, geo program with Hubble to look at um, exoplanets' atmospheres around cool stars, around M stars. Um, so about half of our guaranteed time, and probably at least half of the general observing time, is going toward looking at the intergalactic medium. And so that's why I have to at least have a slide on that, especially because there are cosmologists here. Uh, so I'll just briefly discuss why COS is such a great instrument for looking at the IGM. Um, if you want to hear more about the science side, uh, Kat Barger just took a faculty job at Texas at TCU. So there's a local expert who can tell you all about using COS to do uh, work on the uh, low redshift IGM. Um, but this basically in a nutshell from the instrument builder's point of view is what makes COS so powerful. This is the same background quasar looking through to a quasar and then looking at the, uh, uh, you know, the redshift, the Lyman alpha forest in between. And this is basically nine, a little under 10 kiloseconds with COS versus 
on those three times that was stis and you can see the difference in the signal to noise on that and that allows you to pick out absorbers that were marginal or not detected for example there's an oxygen 6 absorber at a redshift of 0.18 there's another one right down there that was not you couldn't see that before and then a couple more like that <clears throat> and so it, it uh, allows you to observe much more quickly as I said up to 100 times faster depending on the brightness of the target so you can actually really get you know, Hubble time is expensive and hard to get, so this allows you to get more bang for your buck for a certain period of time. Um, and the other nice, the other thing that makes this science in particular so much more powerful is that the work being done right now is in absorption. You find a bright, UV bright background quasar and then look at the path length between you and that quasar to, to, to look at the intergalactic medium of different redshifts. You guys know all about that here. Uh, but what you may not realize is that a factor of 10 improvement in sensitivity takes you from something like 20 UV bright quasars for, that were available to STIS to thousands with cost, more than you can observe. And so what that allows you to do now is that instead of choosing your science based on where those background quasars just happen to be, observers are actually picking what they want to do and then finding the targets that let them do that. They can do things like spatial and mapping, which we couldn't do before. Though. So we've had people get time, geo time, to look at multiple targets behind the Magellanic Bridge, or 12 targets in the halo of M31. And they can say, I want to do this science. I want to look for evidence of cold flow in flow down here versus outflow on this part of the galaxy. And they've actually been doing that. Um, and so the combination of sensitivity and a vastly increased amount of sources has really made this a powerful tool. In the first nine months, I don't have the updated number, but just in the first nine months of science, we covered 10 times the path length in redshift space and 15 times the number of absorbers of all the previous work that had been done at high resolution with Hubble. So that's all I'm gonna say about um, observational cosmology, uh, except one last quote I really like from a paper by Ramil Dave that was published just before COS was launched, where he said, COS will enable study of Lyman alpha absorbers at over densities that are comparable to those detectable at high Z. So what you guys are doing at high Z, we can actually now finally do in the local universe, and we can start tying together those two different properties. Well, I'm going pretty fast. I uh, must have had a little adrenaline. So, uh, <laughs> so I can slow down a little bit and tell you about this new project that um, I've been working on that just started in fact last week. Well, we did the pilot study, the, the Treasury survey just started last week. And this is called the Muscles Program. And basically what we're trying to do is use COS and STIS to determine what sort of radiation environment an exoplanet sees when it's around an M star, in the habitable zone of an M star, so a star cooler than the sun. Um, the reason why this is scientifically motivated uh, I feel like I talk a lot more, I just did a whole 50 minute talk on this, but I tried to stuff this into the, the end of this one. Um, but it's very likely that the first Earth-like planet, by which I mean Earth mass, rocky planet, similar density, may be found around a cool star rather than a G star like the Sun. Um, I don't know if any of you here are involved in the habitable zone planet finder that's being built on AGT. It's quite possible that may find the first Earth-like planet in the habitable zone. And the reason for that is simply that the ratio of the stellar mass, of the, of the planetary mass to the stellar mass is higher for a cool star, so there's more radio velocity tug. There's also, because the habitable zone is closer, there's a higher transit probability for transiting experiments. And, and so a lot of the attention and, and instrument development has been uh, you know, focused on trying to go into the near infrared to find these planets around these cooler stars. But on the flip side then, what sort of planet, what is a planet going to look like when it's in the habitable zone around an M star? Is it going to be habitable? As you probably know, when you're in the habitable zone around an M star, you're actually phase locked. Just like the Earth around the moon around the Earth, you have a day side and a night side, you're fixed, you're going to have a hot and a cool side. And there have been a lot of models saying there may still be habitable regions, especially at the Terminator, you can get some redistribution of temperatures from day to night and some precipitation and et cetera, et cetera. So there's beliefs that there still may be a way to form life, liquid water, regions that we understand as being habitable. Um, but there's another thing that actually affects habitability around M stars, and that's what sort of UV light it's seeing. X-ray and UV light has a profound effect on the atmospheres of these planets, as I'll go into in the next few slides. And when it comes to M stars, we don't actually have 
much information at all. There were five stars in the Hubble database before we started our pilot program uh, that Stis had observed, and they were all flare stars. They were people who were interested in the you know, upper coronian chromosphere of M stars. And so what run-of-the-mill weekly or non-active M dwarf with a planet around it is doing, we didn't actually know. And so when people were modeling planetary atmospheres, they'd either assume there was no UV radiation, or they would pick AD LEO, because we have the best data set on AD LEO existing. But AD LEO is basically like the, fl the flaringest of the flare stars. This is a very, very active star. And so it may not be representative. Uh, as I'll show you in the next couple slides, the UV irradiance looks very different uh, around an M star from what you see in the solar case. And that can affect both the photochemistry of the atmosphere of the planet and how it's heated. The other thing is these cool stars are much more active. They are, they're active for longer portions of their lifetime. And so we don't actually have a good feel for what the UV is doing activity-wise. There's been a lot of work done with Sloan to figure out what's going in the optical. But as I'll show you, the optical and the UV may not be tracing each other as well as we'd like. And so the unknown rate of activity can also affect whether that atmosphere is habitable. Yeah. Do you know if Kepler has any data on uh, planets around that stars? Well, they do, but you know, not nearby enough that I'm aware of, right? Okay. And so, yeah, and I know there's been work on flaring activity in the Kepler yeah. field, there's so about, the stellar side. There's about five detected Kepler M star exoplanet hosts. Okay. About okay. five of those. Um, not, not all of them have good spectrum. <coughs> I'm trying to get that done. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, uh, uh, you can talk to me about that. Okay. All right, so we conducted a pilot study a couple of years ago, and that data are all published. <coughs> and these are the five stars we looked at. And these are the um, far ultraviolet and near ultraviolet. And while this may look like continuum flux here, it actually isn't. It's pseudo continuum. There's maybe 5% or less of the NUV flux could be photospheric emission and nothing on far UV. That's all superpositions of emission lines. There are a number of chromospheric and coronal emission lines that are just adding up to um, create that spectrum. Here is a counterexample. Here's what the quiet sun looks like at 1 AU. Here's what GJ876 looks like at 0.2 AU. That's the habitable, that was where the habitable zone would be around it. And there's some pretty dramatic differences that actually affect what the atmosphere of the planet is going to look like. For one thing, the far UV to NUV ratio in an M star is about 1. And it's about 0.001 in the sun. And you can see that by looking at it. As much light's coming out in the far UV as the NUV for this cool star, whereas in the, in the sun you're getting a lot more um, NUV emission from the photosphere, continuum emission, and that's dropping off. So that's plotted here. Here are our stars, and then here's HD 189733. That's a K star, and a you know, transiting exoplanet, and here's the sun. Uh, I'll go back to that one. I meant to move that down. Uh, yeah, there it is. Sorry. Uh, in addition, about 90% of the flux in far UV is emitted in Lyman Alpha. And in fact, Lyman Alpha in these M stars emits as much as the rest of the far UV plus NUV combined. And that's shown here. The ratio of the flux coming out in Lyman Alpha versus NUV flux for the same targets. The other thing that came out of our pilot study is that there's no such thing as a UV quiet M star. Even when you look at standard optical indicators like H alpha or calcium 2, H and K, it suggests they're either quiescent or only weakly, have a weak chromosphere, they all vary. Uh, and they varied on time, you know, 50 to 500 percent on the time scales that we were able to look at in the pilot study, which was just 100 to 1,000 seconds. So that suggests that we need to get much better information about how we can trace what's happening in the UV based on proxies in the optical. And then just as an aside, uh, we had one system with low signal noise, but of all the other systems, there was bright molecular hydrogen fluorescent emission. And there's a number of places that could come from. It could come from the photosphere of the star. That's not that exciting, uh, at least not from the exoplanet point of view. But it could also come from the planet itself. Um, there's fluorescent emission from Jupiter, uh, as well as uh, electron impact uh, H2. Or it could come from circumstellar material if, if there's actually, if the star's atmosphere, or planet's atmosphere is being blown off. And the reason that's maybe interesting, at least intriguing, is that the other five stars that were in the Hubble archive, for which we don't know of any exoplanets, don't have molecular hydrogen. So now we want to say, is this a trend? And this is something that hopefully in our, in our um, treasury survey that we just started, we'll actually be able to see if that holds up. Especially because the this, this, this targets 
had lower signal to noise, and so it's possible that we're going to look at four stars that don't have any known exoplanets. Uh, it may be that they did have H2 that was buried in the noise. All right, so what do those differences in the UV spectrum do to the exoplanet's atmosphere? Well, it just so happens that the emission, where the emission is coming out in these lines in the far UV, happens to line up with the cross sections of a number of important molecules. So you notice here's lime and alpha, and here's a cross absorption cross section of water peaking up. Similarly, CO2 here coinciding with a number of the other chromospheric lines. And so when you actually try to model then that input, what you find is that you can disassociate these molecules using the far UV flux. And then they can form O2 and ozone, and you can actually get that about two to three orders of magnitude higher than in planets around G stars in an M star's atmosphere. And you can sort of see these are the models from Feng Tian's paper using our first target. Uh, and so you can see the O2 and the ozone production here. But O2 is with the biomarkers. Stay tuned. All right, so you've got FUV in, the, in these M stars that are producing O2 and O3. Now, normally that'd be blown apart by the NUV light, but your NUV light is now a factor of a thousand lower than it is relative to the FUV from the sun. So now, what you have is the potential production of what people thought were biomarkers when there isn't actually any biological life. In particular, the presence of O2 or O3 plus water and low CO2 was considered an, a great biomarker. And that may be true for G type stars, but for an M star, it's not reliable. Uh, now, there are other biomarkers. There's a paper out by Domegal, um, I can't remember if it was, uh, anyway, I can tell you later. There's, there's a paper that came out that suggested that instead you need to look for O2 or O3 plus CH4, because that can indicate that you have enough that you wouldn't be able to sustain these, these um, uh, oxygen molecules without having some type of uh, biological life. But you can't use the classic one, at least for an M star, without paying careful attention to what that happened in that atmosphere. Uh, so photochemistry is very important. Uh, it's very important to understand the UV, um, but the, it also matters for the heating of the atmosphere. The, what I call the XUV, which is soft X-ray EUV emission, drives heating of the atmosphere, and that's not just in these hot Jupiters. Keep in mind, again, these habitable zones are pretty close in for these stars, so it could actually drive possible mass loss in these M star habitable zone planets as well. Um, you can't uh, observe the EUV directly, uh, but what we can do with our data, and we're getting simultaneous X-ray data in our, in our Treasury survey, is back out what that's going on in the EUV. You can use the X-ray emission to determine the coronal component of the EUV emission, and you can use the far UV line. Um, Jeff Linsky has written a couple of papers where he's proxying uh, carbon-4 and magnesium-2 and lime and alpha back into what's going on in the lime and continuum in the EUV. And so we're actually going to be able to use our data to back out how much heating of that atmosphere is actually taking place. Uh, and then the last thing I'll note is that flaring matters. Segura et al. did a study of a single flare. They took the AD Leo super flare and said, what happens then? And basically, that can photolyze. That can, that can drive out up to 90% of your ozone, a single super flare. Uh, and he said that it won't be dangerous to anybody on Earth, but that's only true as long as you have a magnetic field. Particulate emission could be dangerous if you don't have some type of protective magnetic field. But what we don't know yet, and we'd like to know from our data, is what what about multiple smaller flares? You know, one super flare can do this, and probably you photolyze O3, and then you can produce more later. I don't know the time scales of that. Um, but what do you do when you have a bunch of little ones, like we were seeing in our pilot study? So we're going to try to understand that. Uh, so this is ongoing right now. It's called the Muscles Treasury Survey. Uh, Kevin France at the CU's the PI. Uh, we have 125 orbits with Hubble to observe 15 cool stars that have exoplanets. We're going to get both COS and STIS. COS is better to get the far UV emission lines except for Lyman Alpha because we're slitless. The air glow is a problem, so we're going to use STIS to get Lyman Alpha as well as some of the uh, uh, far UV coverage. And simultaneous with our far UV spectra, we're also going to get Chandra or XMM and ground based optical spectroscopy and photometry, and that's the part I'm leading. Um, the idea then is if we look at U-band photometry and optical spectra, things like I said, like calcium-2, H and K, and H-alpha, simultaneous with the UV, can we actually track and create a reliable proxy for what's going on in the ultraviolet based on what you see in the optical. And that's going to be important because Hubble may turn off in a few years and we don't have any UV when the first habitable zone around an M star is found, and then we've got to try and back out what's going on without being able to directly observe that. Uh, 
so we just started. Our first target went off uh, Saturday, October 11th, so a week, a little over a week ago. Um, so I'm reduced to I've been working on the data now. And, and uh, this is just a summary of the, what I already said to you before, that we, we use, the NUV affects what's going on in O2 and O3, whether they, those molecules survive. The far EG drives a lot of the photolysis of the other molecules and the formation of O2 and O3, and then the extreme ultraviolet drives the heating, and we're going to tie all of these together using our data set. So all these starts, do you So 15, we're, it's the standard, if anybody who works in exoplanets, they name the 15 nearby M stars and a couple K, and they can tell you it's the usual suspects. So, the box yeah. super Jupiter? No, no, all, uh, these are all the ones with, um, no hot Jupiters, but you know, nobody's, there's a couple of them where there's a planet on the edge of the habitable zone, a couple of them that are, you know, but mostly they're just bigger planets that are really All right, so looking ahead, um, <coughs> our community has had continuous coverage of the ultraviolet wave band since 1978, that's when IUV launched. And I think that's, as a result, it's something the community takes for granted, whether you're an ultraviolet scientists or not, I think even if you're not, you're quite often used to being able to get multi-wavelength observations, panchromatic support for programs and other wave bands. Uh, but when HST ends its mission, that may not be available for a while. There's almost nothing else up there right now. Uh, both SWIFT and XMM have a couple of optical telescopes, and uh, SWIFT is actually starting to get a lot more. I sat on a SWIFT TAC panel recently, and there are a lot of people proposing just to use this UV capability, it's actually becoming much more competitive, simply because there isn't, that's the only camera out there right now, well, it's, sorry, ACS obviously, but, and wide field camera three, but they're a lot harder to get time, and the field of view is a little different. And the Europeans, uh, in particular the uh, uh, Russians and the Spanish are trying to develop a European World Space Observatory, so that may go off, but uh, um, it, we don't know, I think that's, it's been pending, it's been, you know, in a few years now for quite a while. Uh, there are no UV missions in active development, and considering how long it takes a mission to be actually ready to launch after selection now, that means we're, we're probably going to be looking at a, at a trough in this coverage. The Hubble, they hope, will last till 2020 to overlap with a couple years with JWST, but that's really going to depend on the electronics, the, the gyros, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, there may be, and, and this decadal uh, pushed off the next UV optical mission until the next decade. So there's going to be some work on small, you know, technology development and possibly smaller missions, but nothing big for a while. Uh, and there's also been some discussion um, trying to, you know, people trying to get stuff through. And so you have people like Wes Traub at JPO who's been really pushing, oh, let's merge the exoplanet and the and the uh, UV people and create a single mission. And you can do that, but you need to do some technology development because those people want to do coronography. So they have very specific requirements on their, um, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, wavefront error. And that determines what sort of coatings you can use. And so to develop a coating that meets their requirements for coronography and has UV throughput, that can take a little bit of work. But there's stuff going on right now. But I would argue we do need to start working now for the next U big UV optical mission. So I encourage you as we run into the starting in the few years, considering the next decade of science, to think about that capability. In the meantime, I'm part of a project that will be going in the proposals to do in December, I believe, uh, called Sublime. And this is uh, Sublime and Alpha Explorer. This will be going to the NASA Small Mission Explorer, or SMEX call. There's going to be, so the, uh, the rumor has it there are 18 proposals going in. All the, all the aerospace guys talk to each other, so they know all this. And they'll maybe select three for a phase A study, and then they'll down select one. So there's going to be one SMEX this decade. Uh, and so we'll see what happens, but we're putting one in. Jim Green is the PI, and he gave a talk at SPIE this summer if you're interested. Uh, but Jim, as usual, uh, like he did with COS, came up with a really novel optical design that will allow the first imaging capability below Lyman Alpha. And in particular, it will also cut off before Lyman Alpha, which otherwise that would blow away our background flow. Um, and so basically what he's doing is what he calls differential band pass imaging. He disperses the light and then re-images wavelengths on different parts of the detector. So you can see the different colors here. And what that means is you can scan your target across the detector and then subtract one band from another and actually get what we would call pseudo regions in the uh, pseudo filters, you would call it. There's no transmissive optics in the far EV, there are no filters, so we have to do it this way. 
Uh, and so the proposed instrument will have a field of view of 10 arc minutes at 2 arc second imaging resolution. So it's going to be smaller field of view than Galax, but substantially better spatial resolution. Um, or it's a small, it's a 0.5 meter telescope. The, the throughput's smaller than Galax, but we're going to be doing a more targeted mission. So actually our sensitivity will be comparable. We'll just have to observe longer on targets. I'll skip that. That's the optical design. Uh, but science drivers for the instrument are in particular to detect Lyman and alpha escape emission. Because we can actually tune where those pseudo filters are, we can basically, by setting our scan region on the detector and how we subtract, can pick a region that's below Lyman, the Lyman limit and above the Lyman limit, depending on the redshift of the galaxy, and we can tune that. And so we're actually going to be able to have a really uh, a very tight uh, emphasis on determining whether we can detect Lyman alpha escape, and we're going to do a survey of uh, by galaxies. Getting this emission here, which in this plot is called the LUV uh, Lyman ultraviolet, uh, is really nice. Be it's a really nice complement to what Galax did because Galax was very sensitive to ho the hottest stars, but it couldn't distinguish between O and B stars. And if you go into Lyman ultraviolet, you actually can. And so now we're actually with a full survey can get separate what the O and B star populations are doing and track the O stars, although there are less of them are the primary drivers of a lot of the, you know, the, the metal enrichment, but also the kinematics winds and, and uh, supernova, supernovae uh, kinematics driving into the, uh, the evolution of the galaxy and feedback effects, so we'll be tracing that. And we'll also, if this goes forward, be looking again at more of these exoplanet hosts in the ultraviolet. And we should have a geo program. So uh, hopefully we will get something in the future, uh, that, but that's what we're working on right now. Uh, so in conclusion, COS is the most sensitive UV spectrograph that's flown, at least at the medium resolution. The ACS PRISM is about this kind of sensitive. Uh, it's been performing well since it was installed and it's been doing some absolutely great science both within the team and, um, and uh, among the general observer community. And that I hope in the future we will continue to have the UV capability either through these small mission programs and hopefully within many of our career lifetimes uh, another large UV mission out. Thank you. More questions? Yep. The, the, the most expensive part of, of the mission, the instrument launching? Uh, I think it's the launch. The launch is, I don't know, $500 million, something like that. It's pretty, yeah, it's the launch. I don't know the exact breakdown. All right, cost. So, for example, cost is an $80 million instrument. I think the total amount of hardware that's flown up there totaled something like four or five hundred million. But then I think a lot of the rest of that was, and that I think that builds in all the working time, you know, all the. So it's not just the parts. Yeah, that includes the marching army. I got or one called it the Hubble Marching Army. All the people on staff. I can't remember what the burn rate was at a god or two hundred thousand dollars a month, something like that, just in salaries. So, uh, but then the rest of it's all the launch. Yeah. So, people consider you're you're showing a plot there, you know, saying that there's a part of the plot of the presentation, part of the presentation where you're talking about how, um, you know, these water or oxygen lines might yeah. not actually be that useful for um, end wars. Have people considered looking at um, lines due to water ice? I think I think that's what they're doing in the infrared, right? With all the transit spectroscopy, those are well, it's, it's not ice, it's molecules. Um, maybe on the night side of the planet, but I don't know. I mean, the reason I'm asking is I know that you know sometimes people when they go out skiing they get sunburns because <laughs> of the the ultraviolet, right? They yeah. Like reflect off the snow, and, and I'm just thinking about you know like the Earth is really the only planet close to the sun that has. Like yeah, I don't think we have the sensitivity for that because even COS has trouble getting um, observations of, we've been trying to do that on Enceladus and Callisto uh, and some comets. That's part of our guaranteed time in Southwest and, and so the signal and noise close. was pretty marginal, yeah. So even with stuff nearby in our own solar system, we don't have the sensitivity for that yet. Okay. Maybe if you flew, if you flew there. <laughs> yep. So you, you would one of your kind of big things is this, this UV data availability horizon. Um, and it seems like the, the exoplanets are kind of surprising. The cost are saying, wow, we ended up with this emergent intersection. Um, and that seems like that's a really powerful kind of 
level there for agri plants are, 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 are definitely part of that horizon and it seems like you know, maybe that's the way we can do that. I think the, the optics, in particular the creativity of, of these optics that are on the box, is that you know, the making clarity and how do you, is, is that kind of what people, I guess, from your side of the field are looking at and how do we, how do we get that merger? For the yeah. The problem is always cost driven in the end because I think while we would like UV imaging and that's what we're proposing for spectroscopy is really what the UV does, has done in the past quite well. But what the coronography people are going to want is imaging and so if we have a two channel system where at least all the optics that the chronographs use are highly stable, um, that should be, and then we can pick off a separate channel for our work, then I think we could do that. But then you start ringing up the dollars and I think that's where the issue's just been, can you find a sweet spot where you can build something for you know, whatever, at W purse now, they're talking less than 800 million, 700 million, the number keeps sort of trickling down. And, and um, so that's possible, and there's been a lot of work at JPL. Um, Matt Beasley at, at CU started this with JPL, where they're looking at atomic layer deposition, growing coatings um, that are highly stable and low wave front error, that are also highly reflective in UV, and so that there's been some development work done on that. Um, but the, uh, so that's the main thing, that there's a certain type of optical train where we have to split off to, to if we really wanted to tune each side to what the science case that we want. So it looks like dollars and cents, and is it, is it, is it, yeah. is it, is it worth it? Because one thing I didn't talk about working on Hubble, especially having come from the ground-based world and still working in it, there's just so much money in this program. It was it was like being on the gravy train for 12 years. I mean, it just, and that's something we probably won't see again. You know, But we had a problem with one of our gradings in uh, NUV grading, which is a channel that's you know two percent of the users use, was showing some declining sensitivity before launch. And Goddard said, "Oh, just order another grading." And we said, "Well, that's twenty thousand euros." They're like, "Fine." <laughs> you know? And so it, it, it was. It wasn't that money was no object, but it was the closest you get in astronomy. And that's even in, on the NASA side. I think those days are coming to an end. So, <laughs> so it was nice while it lasted. <laughs> yep. Back when I was in the astrophysics subcommittee, one of the things that about, uh, about is wondering about what the future of the launch capabilities so, are. Yeah. As you as you showed you know, Kennedy was really set up for incredibly delicate and sensitive instruments onto the spacecraft launch. Yeah. Future um, commercial launch vehicles are not going to have those facilities. And so we're going to also have to, to to change the way we think about the satellites in the future is asking about supporting so, what really worries me is that you have all these incredible technicians at Kennedy and so forth that kind of launch. And those people are probably going to go away as we go yeah. more and more towards these commercial launch vehicles. So the, the launch cost may go down of course, losing a lot of people in the launch yeah. from us. And that's particularly true in the UV. I think when you work in the IR, you get a lot of help from the dark ops side military. But UV is a really small field. And you know, I see you as a sounding rocket program they've been running for 25 years, and they'll run into cases where they buy a filter, uh, an Indian filter from somebody who's provided them with great filters for the last 15 years, and then they're just crap. And it's because the guy, the one guy who knew how to build them retired. And that can happen in, in niche, not, I hate to say niche, but we're not, UV's not a big field. We're not x-ray or, or being able to leverage much of commercial work. And so that is a big problem. I know that's something Alan Stern's been working on a lot since he left NASA. Is he's been working with SpaceX and a couple of these other programs to really get them to think about whether they could launch science type missions on their platforms as well. The other problem with a lot of the rocket launches is they're getting too expensive. NASA, I mean, a Delta uh, four is a Delta four will cost you four hundred million dollars, and then you can't launch the specs on that anymore. So. It, that cost. That's right. Well, we, you know, that's not part of our bid, and then that SMEX call, I can't remember the exact, this one we're putting in is 100, 150 million, and that doesn't include the launch that's borne by NASA, but NASA has to pay for that, and so it goes into the total amount of money that they'll allow you to propose for. Before we thank our speaker again, um, we did schedule graduate harassment at, thank you for your email, so 2.30, so that will be, I think, on the fifth floor here, but otherwise there is a schedule. So I don't email. If you want to get on it, let me know. I'll see if we can squeeze you on. Otherwise, thank you for speaking.